he was the one great love of my life. He was so unique. He left such a vivid impression on your mind. Eddie Cochran was raw rock and roll. He influenced so many people that I've met. George Harrison and, and the different artists that I've met throughout the years, Rod Stewart, who said changed their lives forever when they saw Eddie Cochran. That's when they knew that's what they wanted to do. Not Elvis, but Eddie Cochran. British audiences in 1960 were hungry for American rock and roll. 21-year-old Eddie Cochran, who was brought over to support fellow American Gene Vincent, caused a sensation. Eddie Cochran was more than just a singer. He was an outstanding guitarist who wrote his own songs. He pioneered studio recording techniques, overdubbing his own instruments long before it became standard practice. Those who saw him live on stage have never forgotten it. I really, really, really loved Eddie Cochran. To start with, he was American. And you've got to remember, this is 1960. Communication was poor then. And we weren't used to having American people coming over to us. And I loved him, and I thought that if he looked at me, he may actually want to marry me. I can always remember the, the opening scene. The curtains rolled back, and there was Eddie Cochran with his back to the audience guitar was slung on his hips and then the spotlight came on him and uh, just a shimmer of light you just heard the opening chord of what I say the old rock uh, Ray Charles number what I say he got to the vocal part he swung round with the guitar at the ready and went into his act one of the best openings I think I've ever seen suddenly he's there in front of you you just wanted to reach out and touch him sort of sexy stance with his sunglasses and he just gradually removed them step forward the girls were screaming and you know they it was absolutely bedlam i was just screaming i mean i was i was i was just screaming i just couldn't believe that i was actually in this auditorium breathing in the same air as eddie cochran <laughs> In them days, we were very backward, uh, the country. I mean, uh, hamburgers did, kind of didn't exist. I mean, you know, yes, we, we knew about them, and somebody tried to make one occasionally, but we had no idea what hamburgers were about. And of course, also, coming from the Sunshine State, they were always freezing. I mean, if you look at a lot of the pictures of Ed, you'll see him wearing that flying jacket with the fur, jet, with the fur collar. And he was always wearing I mean, he used to wear that in the dressing room. You know, because he was so cold. Even with the headline artist Gene Vincent as a constant companion, Eddie was still homesick. He phoned his girlfriend, Sharon Sheely, who was back in Hollywood. There was an urgency in his voice I'd never heard before when he asked me to come over. There was a, it was almost uh, like I had to come. I had to be here. I had to be with him. Now I know why, but at the time it was just such an urgency and I knew that I, I had to go. And I asked my mom and my mother said, absolutely not. 
you know, nice girls don't go halfway across the world to be with their boyfriends. And then it became a screaming match about going. And then she said, well, we'll leave it up to your grandmother, for which immediately I thought, oh boy, I'm dead in the water. I mean, this is an old Italian lady who is head of about 400 people in our family. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, the little old lady who had opened the church for, you know, to have mass for father every morning, she's going to ask her if I can go to England and be with my boyfriend in the 50s, you know, well, you, let me tell you, your odds on that one were not very good. So she wrote off to my grandmother, and a miracle, my grandmother wrote back and said to her, let her go. How much time do they have to love? How much time do they have to live? If I call her on the telephone, say, baby, that is all alone. By the time you count, one to four, Jimmy, oh, my joy. Sharon Sheely was a songwriter in her own right. She composed a number one hit for Ricky Nelson, Poor Little Fool. She also wrote songs for Eddie, including the classic Something Else. As the tour progressed, it became clear that Eddie, not Jean, was the main attraction. The last stop was the Hippodrome in Bristol, a week of shows culminating on the 16th of April, Easter Saturday. How long are you staying over in England? Not as long as Jean? No, not quite as long as Jean. I'll be here until April 17th, then I go home for 10 days, and then I'm back near the end of April and uh, stay here for 10 more weeks. Oh, quite a long time. That'll be for the same sort of deal with a package tour. Yeah, it'll be all, all of Jean. Even with Sharon at his side, Eddie was still troubled. He said he'd had a dream a couple nights before, and in the dream, he died. And it was a hor horrible dream, and it was a horrible couple days before I could calm him down and start talking about, we'll be home soon, and lift his spirits again. On the Saturday, he'd rung from the hotel and said, um, can you get us a car to take us back to town? I said, what for? I said, by the time you get up after the show and everything, it'll be time to go to the airport. It's just, and you've got it, because they had everything with him. And he didn't, uh, anything that he was leaving behind was going to be there for when he came back, see, because he was only going home to do an album, to do some recording, uh, and have a break, get, get home, you know. And then he was going to come back to start another tour. Um, and I said to him, you don't need a car. Just, you know, so he said, oh, I want it. I said, no. We had our train tickets. We weren't supposed to take that car. It was at the last minute, Gene started complaining. His leg was hurting. He didn't want to sit on a train for six hours. We could take a car and get there so much faster. It, what Gene wanted, Gene got. You know, that basically was the bottom line. Otherwise, we put up with terrible tantrums, and nobody wanted to go through that. I wasn't booked in for that show, and I got a phone call, can you go up and do a fill a spot? After the show, he was looking out for me, and I was walking down the, 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 the corridor here, and um, he opened his door and he said, um, oh Johnny, he said, um, I believe you've got your own car with you. I said, yeah. He said, um, do you mind if you could give us a lift to Heathrow? And I said, um, Eddie, I'd love to. I really would, because he was a terrific guy. He really was a terrific guy. I said, I'd love to, but I've got a party for that I'm going back to London with anyway. And he said, oh, don't worry, John. He said, I'll, uh, we'll get a hire car. We were determined to get the autographs, so we waited outside the stage door. Or they chucked some photographs out, but uh, they wouldn't sign all the autographs. But anyway, we had our car waiting right by the, the theatre, and we actually chased them. We followed because they, we thought they were going back to their hotel, so we thought we'll get their autographs when we get back to the hotel. So we chased them, and we lost them on, I think it was three lamps on Brisington, on the Bath Road, and that we didn't realise, but that they were going back to London. 
And I often think about it, but if I'd only given that lift home, whether well, it would have happened. I knew the minute that car door shut, something was going to happen. The minute the door shut, it was almost like a tomb closing on me. As we drove along, I remember thinking, not we could have an accident, but I remember thinking, when are we going to have the accident? I remember Gene fell asleep, and Eddie and I were awake. I had my head on his shoulder, and he had his arm around me, and we were talking among ourselves. Eddie kept telling the driver, I remember vividly, he kept telling him to slow down. He kept telling him he was going too fast because I was scared. And I would look at Eddie, he was terrified, and he'd lean forward and say, slow down, man, you're going too fast. He told him that about three times, and about three, and he would slow down. And then after a few minutes, he'd pick up that speed again. In those days, the main road to London was the A4 through Chippenham in Wiltshire. In my dreams, I would go under a bridge. I have total amnesia when it comes to that accident. I remember hearing a horrible blood-curdling scream and realizing it was coming from my own throat. And that's all I can remember. The car come round the corner, hit the curb over there, and come zigzag over and hit against the post, and it hit the post side on, and it threw everything and everybody out onto the grass. Well, anything in the road, it was all on the ground. And it was just like a battlefield. You couldn't say anything else. And As I went up Rowden Hill, I could see that a car had careered off the road, and obviously as a result of an accident. Um, the doors were wide open. The first thing that I noticed was sheets of music was blowing all over the place. And the lady was laid out. Jean Vincent was laid yeah, out. Yeah, it, just moaning, he was. And I could hear this woman's voice calling out continually. Where's Eddie? Where's Eddie? She, that's that's right. all she What's said. Nothing Eddie? else. Mm. Where's Eddie? Where's Eddie? Mm. And Eddie, whoever Eddie was, of course, I had no idea at the time who he was, was led on the grass. Of course, we got I come back here and we got a coat and put over Eddie Cock. You could see he was sort of really, really bad. Mm. The girl was shouting. So I know she was bad, but I mean, he wasn't even saying anything, Eddie Vic Cock, when he was just sort of breathing, that was all. So we could cut, put something on to keep them warm because it was bitter cold. A lady from one of the nearby houses came out with a blanket and a pillow. She put the pillow under Eddie's head and covered him. And then, of course, just as we were doing that, all the street lights went out because they went out at 12 o'clock. We drove around the corner and, sure enough, we, we saw an ambulance pulling away. We saw bits of paper, which we didn't realise at the time, was sheet music. And this car on its side, and the breakdown truck getting it ready to tow to, to away. So we approached him and said, um, uh, any chance of any petrol, mate? We were stopping, we got to get to London. And he gave us a bit of tube, and uh, we siphoned the petrol from that tank, which was virtually a full tank. At this time, we didn't know who was in the car, you know, it was just a, an accident. So we got home to London with the petrol from Eddie's car. I came to in the ambulance very briefly, and we were holding hands, our hands were locked together. And I remember for one brief moment thinking, oh, he's come to, he's regained consciousness, and he took my hand. And I looked up and the ambulance driver looked down at me and smiled at me and he said, I locked your hands together. Something told me you were in love. And I remember thanking him. And I remember praying so hard to God, please don't let me go under God. Please don't let me lose consciousness. Please, I'll never see him again. I know I'll never see him again. And I lost consciousness and I never saw him again. Step one, you find a girlhood to love. Step two, 
she wants another be with you Step three, you kiss and hold her tightly Eddie Cochran died the next day, Easter Sunday, at St. Martin's Hospital in Bath. Initial reports said the accident had been caused by a puncture. Later investigations showed it was simply excessive speed. Sharon suffered a broken back, neck and pelvis. Evidently, before the crash, Eddie had pulled me over his lap and shielded me, held me down and shielded me with his whole body. And with that, with all of his protection, and when they put us in the ambulances, the doctors later told me that they gave me a 10% chance to live, and yet I pulled through. But believe me, that 10% Eddie gave me, gave me his life. We were told to expect a young lady. It wasn't until she was actually on the ward that we were told that she was uh, Eddie Cochran's girlfriend at the time Eddie Cochran was in the operating theater she was in quite a bad way at the time very distressed and overwrought the record three steps to heaven was on the ward radio and she screamed and shouted for everybody to turn it off so this is where we would have come through yes it would have had no sight, and this would have been the main entrance. It's funny, I can just feel such a strong presence of him here. Such a long, long time ago, and yet it seems like yesterday. Yes. Uh, I left this hospital physically, but I always left my heart here. Yeah, I can hear Billy Fury and Hal Carter laughing in the halls, and I knew they were coming. I can hear all the voices. It hurts. I'm sure it must. It's painful, but I need closure for all of this. And the people here were so wonderful and loving that I give them all the credit yes, for saving my team. life. Is he in here? Yes, this is the holding place, the chapel of rest. It was in use at that time, but no longer. It seems so lonely. This is too hard for me. I can't do this. It's OK. I want to come outside. Shouldn't have done that. I keep thinking. You've been wonderful, you know, very brave. <sighs> You've been very oh, sweet. I've met you. Thank you. Very proud to have met you, too. That you will be remembered. And come back to me. The quiet market town of Chippenham, where the accident happened, has become a place of pilgrimage for rock and roll fans. The Cochrane name lives on in the shape of Eddie's nephew, Bobby Cochrane. His father co-wrote Three Steps to Heaven. Members of Buddy Holly's Crickets played on the original recording at what was to be Eddie's last session, recorded on the day he left for England. The session also included Cherished Memories, a song written by Sharon. Forever, 
someone with us that really this means something very special because we have Sharon very very important in Eddie's life and what better fitting thing than to have the crickets with us because they were Eddie's friends too this is the finest way to put down a commemorative plaque to the man that we all respected we loved his music we still do today and he will never be forgotten it's always be a, a cherished memory just like it says here and I will always miss Eddie Cochran. I know you will, darling, so will I. I remember when I wrote this song and you drummed on that song. That's right. And Eddie sang that song and we were all together. And I feel like we're all together today, don't you? Yes. He's right here with us. Yes. Absolute, right? Absolutely. That's right. So right Baby. And I'll put the first guitar pick on, which is from Phil Everly. Okay. Wow. Oh, look at that. Here she comes. Next Wednesday at 10.30, Paul McGann stars in the dramatized documentary, Breathless Hush. It's all mine, just a 41 foot, not a 59. I got that girl and I'm a thinking to myself, she's sure fine looking man, wow, she's something else. When I was in hospital, I had a very kind nurse who sat with me and told me at the time, she said, you, dear, many people will tell you that you're young and that you will love again and time will heal all and in time it'll become a faint memory and you will forget. But she said, you won't. Don't listen to them because you will never forget and it will never fade with time and it will always be with you. She said she lost her husband in the war and her honesty was, was a great hope for me to know it's all right. It's all right not to have him fade. It's the pain is not as sharp today. That does, that does fade, but not those beautiful memories and not those sad memories. They're always there. Oh, oh, oh. 